Good morning, uh, folks. Uh, first, um, this is the trivial uh, video of Dr. David Tapper with courtesy of um, uh, Dr. Robert uh, Sewin. So can you have the video, please? It's my pleasure and honor to help celebrate the 31st president of APSA, David Tapper. David was my mentor, my partner, and my friend, and he leaves a fabulous legacy uh, throughout his whole career. David's career is inextricably linked to other past presidents of APSA. As a young medical student in 1969, he did a rotation at the D.C. National Children's Hospital thinking he wanted to be a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, and there he was fortuitously exposed to Judson Randolph. Dr. Randolph saw the talent in this young man and convinced David that he should become a pediatric surgeon. On Dr. Randolph's advice, he went to the University of California, San Francisco for a surgical residency where he was mentored by Dr. Al Delormier. He then, uh, on Dr. Delormier's advice, went to Boston, where he worked in the laboratory of Dr. Judah Folkman, and there did some of the seminal research on angiogenesis. David continued to be an NIH-funded investigator his entire career. While in Boston, in, in the research lab, and then when he returned as the fellow at Boston Children's, he overlapped with Dr. Marshall Schwartz, and David and Marshall became lifelong best friends. David was a superb surgeon, an exceptional teacher, fabulous clinician, and a consummate leader, both locally in Seattle, but also more importantly, perhaps nationally. David's presidential address on the achievement of audacious goals inspired us to become clockmakers, not timekeepers, and to aim big. And he outlined several goals directed at improving the surgical care of children throughout the United States. And thankfully, over the last 15 years, we've made great progress towards those goals, led by another ABSA president, Keith Oldham, and his efforts in the optimal resources for children's surgery. So David leaves a wonderful legacy in pediatric surgery, and it's been my great honor and pleasure to work with him and to celebrate him today. Just a bit of a reminder, this uh, next um, <clears throat> uh, presentation will be graded, so please uh, fill out your evaluations um, uh, at the uh, evening um, during the president banquet that will be uh, awarded to the winner. So it's very important that we all fill out the, uh, applica um, the survey. So the first presentation will be uh, small surgery, big smile, reducing sedation through virtual reality to be presented by uh, Dr. Julia Chandler. Hi, good morning. My name is Julia Chandler from Stanford University. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present. Today I'm going to be talking about our uh, process of using virtual reality to reduce the need for sedation in minor surgical procedures. We have no financial disclosures. Child fear and anxiety often necessitates the use of anesthesia for simple diagnostic and therapeutic procedures. However, there's risks of anesthesia, especially when it's being performed outside of the operating room, and so we're trying to reduce its use as much as possible. Prior research has shown that increased cognitive load can decrease pain-related cerebral activation, suggesting that distraction techniques might be helpful for reducing pain during procedures. Other distraction techniques have been studied, but virtual reality has only recently become available for use in the clinical setting. Virtual reality, or VR, is a technology that engages the user in an immersive and oftentimes interactive experience. It's recently reached a threshold of accessibility and affordability for routine use in the clinical setting. It's been used by our group previously for non-invasive uh, but semi-surgical procedures, and you'll actually hear a little bit more about that in the next talk, uh, but we haven't used it for any real surgical procedures until now. So to try to answer this question of whether we could use VR for real surgical procedures, we worked with colleagues in anesthesia to develop custom virtual reality games specifically for use in the medical setting. We've used it for three minor surgical procedures, hormone implant placement, hormone implant removal, and cecostomy tube exchange, 
and we used a number of validated measures for pain and anxiety for parents and also for children, as well as satisfaction scores for patients, parents, and caregivers. So here's a video of a child using the virtual reality for a hormone implant exchange. The VR headset covers her eyes completely, so she can't see the procedure that's happening. She's playing a game called Dream Flight, where she's able to control with her head her movements, and she's collecting diamonds for points as she flies through the air. There are also some provider controlled features so that the game can increase distraction uh, during times of the procedure that are expected to be more painful. Another popular game is called Pebbles the Penguin. Oh hi, wanna come slide with me? I need some help finding pebbles. Let's go. Uh, notably, as these games are designed for use in the medical setting, there's a no-fail state, meaning that the game continues on indefinitely until the procedure is over. Uh, so, so far we've used this technology in a total of 21 patients, ranging in age from 6 to 22 years old. Most of the patients have been English speaking, but notably this technology is very easy to apply even for patients who don't speak English. The duration of procedures have lasted anywhere from 6 minutes to 56 minutes, with a mean duration of 12 minutes, and notably not a single patient has required placement of an IV or any sedating medications. Here are the results of our parent and child anxiety, pain, and fear scales. Overall, both parents and children experienced reductions in their pain and anxiety before the procedure compared to after the procedure. These are results of our patient satisfaction scores and our parent and clinician satisfaction scores. Overall, the technology has been very well liked and thought to be useful to reduce pain and anxiety both before and during the procedure. Um, the vast majority of patients would recommend VR to others and would want to have VR again if they were to have a similar procedure in the future. So in conclusion, we believe that it's feasible to use virtual reality to reduce pain and anxiety during minor surgical procedures. VR is well liked by patients, caregivers, and providers, and it may be an effective way to reduce the need for procedural sedation. Our next steps include a randomized trial of virtual reality versus the standard of care, and an expanded use of virtual reality to a broader range of procedures. This work wouldn't have been possible without our great team from pediatric surgery and also pediatric anesthesia at Stanford. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to take any questions. This is abstract, it's open for question, but first I want to throw, um, see a show of hands. Who is using this technology at your workplace? Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Julia. That was a great presentation. I'm Doug Miniotti from Permanente Medicine in uh, Northern California. So at our, our Kaiser Permanente hospitals, we're also adopting this technology. And um, I wonder if you could comment on some of the intricacies of getting it going. We use Child Life to help uh, institute it. Uh, and we found there's a lot of you know variability in some unexpected challenges, like exactly what ages are appropriate for which modules. and you mentioned, you know, the, the games that require the patient to sort of turn their head around and that can sort of interfere with procedures that are ongoing. Um, we're also, like you, looking into using this for very simple things like IV placement, IV removal. There's like a million uses you could potentially use for it. Do you have like a governance system for, you know, who maintains them, how they stay, uh, you know, infectious, free, and, um, and not get lost in the wards. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that question. I think you're bringing up um, a couple of really interesting points about bringing any new technology into the healthcare setting. Um, 
In this case, thinking first about the development of the games, that was really led by our chariot program, which is run through pediatric anesthesia. Um, and they have a number of different technologies that they've been working to develop specifically for these kind of uses. And the next presentation, you'll actually hear a little bit more about some of those. Um, they're also, um, and one big component of that is making them appropriate for medical use. So the games that you saw here, um, they require very slight movements of the head, not you know, a ton of movement. We also have some games that require no movement of the head that are more, less interactive because of that, or more meditative. Um, the other um, very interesting thing is that you can control the horizon of these games um, so that you can position the patient's head in whatever direction, up or down or to the side, and the game will reorient to be in that location. So you have some control over the patient's position, even in the games where there's some movement required. Um, you also bring up an interesting point about you know, actually using it in the clinical setting. So far since for this project, it's been a pilot study. So we've always had a research staff involved there, but Child Life has also been very interested in using this and actually now has their own VR headset as well that they help children learn to use. And uh, going forward, we're hoping that, uh, you know, as this moves less from the research setting and more into routine clinical practice, um, that it can just be a surgical provider and a child life specialist with the patient during a procedure like this. And in and, and terms of like infectious precautions and maintenance of where they're housed and all that, did you have to establish a sort of governance of that? Definitely. Management? So that's still, that's primarily run through our uh, pediatric anesthesia chariot program and they control most of them. Child Life does, have, as I mentioned, have one that they use and then we have one that we use for research purposes and it's sort of up to each of those individual teams to keep track of their own devices. Um, and we do routinely clean them between procedures, um, but, but there's not a sort of formal infectious uh, control process yet. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Last question, Dr. Nass. Uh, Donald Nass, Boise, Idaho. Um, do you use local anesthetic in addition to your VR? Yes, the patients do receive local anesthetic. So the, um, the next presentation is the CHERA's program, um, Program in Technology Development Future Uses, to be presented by Dr. Jordan Taylor. It's the same group. All right, good morning. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present, and hopefully I can answer some of the practical questions. Uh, we have no disclosures related to this uh, work. So it's my pleasure to tell you a little bit about uh, the CHARIOT program at Stanford. CHARIOT is our acronym for the Childhood Anxiety Reduction Through Innovation and Technology. Um, this is a program, as, as Julia mentioned, that was started by two of our pediatric anesthesiologists. Since starting, we've realized that we can also treat pain with this. We can also treat adults who like virtual reality and other technologies, uh, but we're sticking with the CHARIOT acronym for the time being. So the best way to show you the motivation behind this, uh, this whole program essentially is, is in this picture here. This is uh, one of our an pediatric anesthesiologists, and that's actually his daughter. Uh, <laughs> she wasn't actually even being induced into anesthesia. She was just asked to pose for a photo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> However, we, we do know that uh, childhood fear and, and anxiety, particularly around induction of anesthesia, is a huge problem. Up to 30 to 40 percent of patients will have some distress, and about half of those will have severe distress. Um, about 40 percent will have some resistance to induction. So the goal of this program essentially came from this to trying to change the situation into something more like this. So to do this, we aim to develop essentially a, a toolbox using immersive technologies to improve uh, our outcomes in the perioperative um, arena. And we can do this using a variety of technologies. Phone and tablets are clearly the most common uh, worldwide and also in the States. Um, but there are more advanced technologies that I'd like to talk to you guys about, particularly the video projection, augmented reality, and virtual reality. So this is BERT. This is our bedside entertainment relaxation and relaxation theater. BERT consists of um, a bedside mounted battery powered projector and a two foot by three foot screen that's mounted on the gurney. This can roll with a patient into the operating room and be used during induction of anesthesia. We can play various media on that, whether it's commercially available Netflix, uh, Hulu, YouTube, things like that. But we've also developed uh, custom entertainment and custom games that can help with induction of anesthesia. One such game is uh, called Sivo the Dragon. 
Uh, in this game, the children are allowed to select their dragon and select the food that the dragon is then going to cook. I'll show you a little bit of that. One, two, three. Rock! Good job! All right. Now, why is he eating the taco game? Remember? So when the patient breathes in and breathes out, it's actually hooked up to the game so that the dragon itself will breathe in and out and cook the food. I can smell the children the are able to go off to sleep. One, two, three. So since implementing this, we found it to be very successful, um, both in terms of just patient and parent satisfaction, um, as well as, uh, more importantly for us, looking at our midazolam use preoperatively. Uh, in the, the quarter before implementing and after implementing, we, we reduced our midazolam use from 33% of patients to 14%. The next technology is uh, augmented reality, and this is probably a little bit less known than virtual reality. This is a system where you can superimpose visual information on the actual environment without limiting the patient's or the, the user's uh, field of view. Uh, this is perfect for the kids that want to see what's going on but do want some distraction. We've been able to use this in various procedures including blood draws, IV placement, port access, dressing changes. So the story I want to tell you about this one is AJ. AJ is an 11-year-old boy who has autism. He had to have a surgical procedure but given his um, size, he has a BMI of about 57, gas induction was not an option. Um, but he did have a pretty significant uh, needle phobia. So. This is demonstrating how he was able to use augmented reality to have an IV placed. Hi, I'm Jenny. Hi. Where are your veins? They are those blue lines that carry blood throughout your body. So Benny and Jen are the two robots that are existing in our augmented reality system that can be used to explain the procedure to patients and families um, and also provide some distraction for the patient. The other feature I want to point out here is that the uh, provider can change and augment uh, what, the, what the patient is seeing, either increasing or decreasing the distraction as needed. And he described this as his best IV ever. Finally, I'd like to just touch on uh, virtual reality as Julia uh, introduced to us. Virtual reality is this immersive experience with an artificial environment. Um, it's been used, as Julie mentioned, in medicine uh, to reduce pain and anxiety for small procedures. We're really trying to see what procedures and what, um, what situations we can use this most appropriately. So these are a few of the games that we've developed. And as Julie mentioned, these games are designed for the medical field. Um, they have uh, various features uh, that help us to use them in the medical field, such as the control of the horizon so that the patient, even if they're in a reclined position, doesn't have to move their head to, to see the, the game in front of them. There are games that are controlled by minor head movements, uh, some that are controlled by major head movements, I will say, that we don't use, um, and then some that are controlled by, uh, by a remote. Um, we have used this for vascular access um, in many patients. And we found actually comparing those that just received standard of care to virtual reality, our success on first time attempt actually improved significantly. In pediatric general surgery, as Julia mentioned, we've been able to use this with uh, hormone implant uh, placement and removal. We've also been able to use it with incision and drainage procedures and secostomy tube exchanges. We're just implementing a study that we are looking at using it for post-operative pain and anxiety where the patients are given the VR headset ahead of time, taught through the virtual reality headset how to use uh, guided meditation, uh, and then trying to use this afterwards to reduce anxiety about their pain. Uh, our pediatric ENT colleagues are using this with nasal endoscopy. You can see one of the examples here. And our pediatric orthopedic surgeons um, have been using this with uh, cast removals, pin removals, and they're actually uh, involved in a randomized control trial where they're looking at standard of care versus what's called either active VR, where it's more engaging, more interactive, or passive VR, where they're experiencing um, some other environment without that active involvement. And we are looking for future uses, so definitely please give us your suggestions. So just quickly, I want to go over some of the practical considerations for implementing a program like this. Um, first and foremost, it's patient selection. This does not work for every patient. Um, so far in our experience, we've had 
the vast majority of patients agree to participate and are interested in participating, but there are certainly those that are just not interested in the technology and prefer more standard of care. Um, there is an age that's appropriate for this, and we also have to select the games that are appropriate for each age. Um, and then I will say that there are, there are certain contraindications, such as uh, headaches, migraines, motion sickness, things of that nature that will prevent kids from, from being able to use this successfully. Um, we have to consider how long the procedure is going to be, what's the positioning of the patient, and location as well. Thus far, we've been doing this in the operating room, but there's no reason that this has to be done in that, situ in that location. Um, we're working on, on translating this more to either a clinic setting or uh, to a less resource-heavy area in the hospital. Um, I will say as a, as a tip, if you're, if you're starting this, do not let the kids play with this for too long because they will get bored with it. Um, so we've learned that you have to limit their exposure preoperatively um, so that they're a little bit more engaged during the procedure. Um, as brought up in one of the questions, cleaning, charging, all of these practical considerations have to be considered ahead of time. Uh, there's nothing great about a Wi-Fi signal cutting out in the middle of your video game as you're playing, as you're wheeling the kid to the operating room. So those things have to be thought of beforehand. Um, a little bit on the technology, as I mentioned, there's the spectrum of immersivity. Um, we tend to use uh, what's uh, minimum required, essentially. And if the kid will be okay with a phone or a tablet, there's not necessarily the need to, to use the full virtual reality headset. When we're designing these games, we do have to think about uh, various principles, such as do no harm. We want these games to be interactive and fun. We don't want any violence in the games. Um, as Julia mentioned, they're non-fail states so that they can continue on um, as long as the procedure's going. One thing I will point out is uh, this provider, um, provider ability to change what's being done in the game. Uh, this is something we call groovy mode. I'll show you here. Let's do groovy mode again. Yay. If we could turn the volume up there. Yep. So this kid really did enjoy our groovy mode. You can see the provider tapped on the side, and this increases the amount of uh, visual information. And, and he did a front flip, yeah. Um, visual information that they're able to receive. Um, finally, I will say this is a multidisciplinary team. It takes uh, quite a few specialties and people to get this program going, um, but it is important to figure out who's the essential people to be in the room for this. Um, and lastly, this isn't a technology that we would say you can give to the child and leave alone. It does require some coaching. Uh, child life has been incredible about re-engaging these patients when, they're, um, when their distraction is not enough to take them away from the procedure that's happening. So they're able to re-engage, reorient the patient back into that virtual reality experience. Um, and I think the last point is just patient safety always has to be paramount, uh, that we're always considering if this is not working for the child, if something's not going smoothly with the procedure, we have to have a plan B in place. So with that, um, I'd like to you know, thank the, uh, the departments of anesthesia and pediatric surgery. Um, there is quite a bit of funding that's gone to the chariot program to help uh, get all of this started, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Jordan. We're going to move on to the next abstract. So the, the next presentation is uh, Abstract S67. It's ultrasound guided inguinal hernia repair presented by uh, Dr. Marcus Jobo from uh, Mott Children's Hospital, University of Michigan. And this is a graded abstract. Hi, you guys. Um, thanks a lot for having me here and allowing me to, to do this, uh, to tell you about this procedure. I don't have any disclosures. So uh, this is a new thing that we've been doing for about a year and a half. Uh, the first thing we're going to, I'm just going to go over the anatomy, um, the technique, and then the preliminary outcomes of this feasibility study that we've been doing. So ultrasound guided inguinal hernia repair. So it's, you know, a hernia repair is a high ligation, and this is no different than any other high ligation except for how do you get the ligature around the uh, hernia sac. Um, uh, you can see the hernia sac. Uh, on ultrasound, um, and one little technical thing is, uh, not so little, is I'm only doing females right now, <laughs> for clear reasons, <laughs> you'll see. Um, but the hernia sac is pretty, pretty clear if there's fluid in it. You can see hernia sacs without fluid, um, 
and I had a, a, one of our radiologists come to every case for the first like dozen. And then Herschel, uh, Ron Herschel, the president, he's pretty smart. And he said, well, why don't you put some fluid in there? And I said, ooh, that's a good idea. So I, with a needle, I put a little fluid into the abdomen and then put a little reverse Grindelberg and lo and behold, uh, the hernia sac like lights up. I mean, that's no surprise, right? But, you know, <laughs> it took Herschel to tell me to do it. But anyway, uh, so, you can see here uh, the, the hernia sac labeled, and it's very clear. And in the close proximity, as everybody knows, there's the iliac vessels and the epigastric vessels. So what we do is we use this um, meniscus repair needle, which is just a bent needle. It's for, you know, ortho stuff. Um, and actually, Josh Short showed me this when I was in Peru. And I'm like, oh, I got to get one of these. Um, and what you do is uh, a little cartoon over here is you, you take the needle, you go through the skin, you go underneath the hernia sac, um, and then out the skin on the other side. And then you pass a suture through, uh, very similar to that epigastric hernia for those of you who have seen it, uh, saw the last session. But you um, then pass the suture through the needle, take the needle out, leaving the suture in place, and then pass the needle through again, only this time going above the hernia sac and then out the same hole on the skin. Then you take the, the suture, you pass it through the needle that's already through there, and then you get this loop and you pull and it, you know, comes on down. And, and, uh, and then you tie it down and it like eats the, the hernia sac, which is, you know, it works pretty darn good. Um, so here on the left is just kind of from the outside. It's real high speed because I didn't want to go through the whole five minute thing or 10 minute thing. Uh, but you can see here going underneath the skin, I mean underneath the sac, in the skin, out the skin. And then suction is very useful. Again, another Ron Herschel a suggestion uh, because it really is a pain to bring the suture through the needle if you don't have suction. And it's kind of fun if you do have suction. It really sucks out like a piece of spaghetti, um, but you have to put a hemostat on the end, otherwise you lose it into the suction container. Um, uh, anyway, uh, here's going on top of the sac, coming through the same holes, um, and then passing the suture again, and then, you know, pulling on the two tails here, um, you can see th there it is. And, and, you, and now you have a ligation of the sac. So over here on the right, right here is the, the needle, and you can see here just below me is the iliac vessels, just above the needle is the hernia sac, and here I'm getting pretty intimate with the epigastric vessels there, but you kind of have to be pretty close to them. Um, so this isn't for the faint of heart or the people who are just trying ultrasound out for the first time. It's certainly something that I think any surgeon can develop these skills. I, I have no doubt about that. Um, but you do need to develop them. Uh, this is not the de developing um, procedure, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, so, so this is not, this is new, right? And so I wanted to make sure that every single kid that I did this on had a perfect repair before they left the OR. So uh, these all have been done except for the last couple under general anesthesia. So what I do is I put a needle scope uh, in, the, in, the, in the belly button. It's a 1.7 millimeter scope. And I check and make sure my ligation of the sac is, is perfect. Um, and here's, a, uh, here's the view after I've put it through. And you can actually see part of the suture right there. And so I have, uh, the first part I, I waited to ligate until I actually was watching. I have been just doing it before I'm watching now, but here's a little video of the closure. It's kind of cool. I, I just think it's kind of cool. Um, but it, it works really good. For the first dozen, it was every time that happens, like, ooh, wow, I can't believe that works. Uh, but it, it works. All right, sorry. Um, so here's the uh, last part. Here's what it looks like afterwards in the baby. Um, so we've done 28 hernias. We have had no recurrences so far, however. Uh, we've only had a median of 10 months follow-up. The first one was December of 2017. Um, so we clearly have not had a good two years follow-up. That's in the plan of doing that later. Um, we've had seven conversions of laparoscopy. That's 27%. Four of those were, I'm seeing stuff that you don't usually see when you're doing it open. Or, you know what I mean? Like, I see these fallopian tubes coming really close, and I'm like, oh boy, is that too close? So I go in and I release the fallopian tube to make sure it's not too close. But to be quite honest, I don't think the, of those four, they weren't true sliding hernias where they were actually stuck in the canal. They were kind of pseudo, not quite sliding hernias. And I don't think I would have had to release the fallopian tubes, but I did um, uh, because it made me feel better about a new procedure. 
Uh, one was a canal of nook cysts, which was kind of crazy. It was the first one I'd ever seen. And I did, I just saw I, Herschel was in there. And I was like, what in the heck is this? And it's like, oh yeah, it's canal of nook cysts. So I converted to open just because, again, this is new and I didn't want to do some goofy thing, um, with, you know, with a new techno to technique. And then I've had two ligation failures. One was before I put fluid in at the beginning when I was new doing it. Um, and I saw it on laparoscope. The second one was actually more recent with the fluid and I, I knew it before I put the scope in. I was like, I can't get around this stupid sack for some reason. So uh, that was the other failure. Um, overall, pretty successful. So I think it's feasible in females. It's safe. Conversion rate right now is unnecessarily high. I think I could change that immediately to pretty low. Um, but again, follow-up study in two years post-op to see what the re real recurrence rate is. This ad track's open for questions. Hi, David Rossi in Buffalo. It's, it is very cool. Uh, can you imagine, you know, we've learned from laparoscopy that you can invert the sac, burn the sac, and not necessarily ligate it. Can you imagine either injecting some sort of plug or putting in a, a amplats or something even to make it that even easy, easier? Sure, I, I've thought about that. Uh, and I've also thought about RFA and cryo, and I'm thinking about as many things as I can. Right now, I kind of thought the R, I thought burning, you know what I mean? Like a little RFA probe would be kind of cool, uh, but I thought that would hurt a lot. Um, this doesn't hurt much. You can do it under pretty reasonable sedation, which is kind of my goal is to do sedation. You know what I mean? Um, I thought about glue, you know, MBCA, because I got the IR background for embolization. Uh, um, a little worried about that squirting in the abdomen. Not that that would be that dangerous, but I'm not sure it'd stay in there. Um, if you think of something, though, let me know, because I'm willing to try m most things um, <laughs> uh, within reason. Hi, Marcus. Um, Tom Inge, Denver. Um, you know, for most of us who don't do this uh, regularly, that is ultrasound, the intercoronal canal goes from the internal to the external ring. What's the tolerance for where you need to place your, you know, ligature? We typically teach and do internal ring, you know, uh, closures, but I can imagine you might be off a little bit, you know, and you have the ability to see the hernia, you know, as it goes through the whole right. canal. That's a great question. So that's the first question. Then the second question is, um, are you going to be adding this to your ultrasound courses that you do at the various venues? Okay, so question number one is great. And that's one I kind of think about every time I'm doing it. Because I really want to make it a high ligation, right? Not a low ligation. I mean, you know. Uh, so with the high ligation, so I use my laparoscopic experience, you know, with hernias. And if you notice, right where... The hernia sac, you like it, your hernia sac and laparoscopy, you're always worried about the epigastric vessels, right? Why? Because the epigastric vessels are diving down into the iliacs to form the femoral, I mean, you know, to, to turn into the femoral vessels. So what I do is I take the ultrasound and I kind of scan up and down, up and down, and see where those epigastrics dive down into the iliacs. And it's that level right before that that that's where I do the level of the ligation, right before that diving down. And that usually ends up being a really nice, perfectly spot, just like you just saw their um, area for ligation. So that's worked pretty well. Now, if you do it a little bit in the wrong spot, it causes you grief. It might have, you know, it doesn't, it goes a little deep and it's not as satisfying, but I still think it's, it's okay. Uh, second thing about the course. Um, well, the, <laughs> it's part of, part of my next talk, but but the, the course, I don't know, I'm not sure I have a great model for it, but the honest, the answer is, is that the, really the key to almost all these ultrasound procedures are is you just got to be facile with ultrasound. You know what I mean? And that just takes some practice. Every person in this room who's a surgeon has that ability. They just have to, you know, like foster that ability. And, and this is something you can do if you can control the needle all the time within a millimeter or two all the time. You know what I mean? You don't want to be somebody that loses their needle, though, and all of a sudden you're in the middle of the iliacs. That would be a problem. Uh, a problem. Uh, lose style points for that. So, uh, so the answer is, in a way, secondarily, yes, the course can do that. But it's really, the course can't bring you to uh, inguinal hernias right away. You have to put in the time to, to learn it. Um, next question. Nathan Avani, Royal Oak, Michigan. So I have a couple questions. One is, have you ever, that you know of, violated the peritoneum? As, as you know, the bowel is right near, next to it. And uh, we're considering starting this as well at Beaumont. And, uh, and, and our concern is that we would we'd put the needle into the bowel or, or somehow injure the bowel. And the other is, we were considering using a solid needle. And even with that, we were concerned about introducing air into the tract and then losing visualization on ultrasound. You're using hollow needle. And I was just wondering if you could talk about how much air you've seen introduced and once once you uh, 
once you make a hole in the skin? So it's a great question. So this isn't really my first roadie. Uh, it's not the first bull I try to run, ride with this one. So I've tried it in the past with a curved needle and I have failed because I just can't get a probe that's small enough and linear enough and high frequency enough to get out of the way of the needle to get good visualization. So I nixed that a long time ago. I just gave up on that. Maybe if you use a huge needle, maybe it'd be okay. I don't know, um, but I just didn't have luck with that. Uh, as far as air, I haven't had an issue with air, but I had this great idea that if I went up real close to the sack and injected saline, I could light it all up and really show the sack real beautiful by injecting sub-Q saline. That did not work, <laughs> all right? That just destroyed all the anatomy that I could tell, and I was like, oh, heck, I just ruined this. Um, so that didn't work, so don't do that. Um, uh, as far as introducing air in other ways, uh, I also uh, have, um, I don't hate to admit this, in my great surgical skill, I've broken a couple of sutures and had to redo these because I get nervous that I haven't got a, you know, because I'm not looking at it, I feel like I need to push it a little harder to make sure that I got it tight, you know what I mean, kind of thing. And I've busted a bunch of, like three times busted two O's. Like, is that's pathetic, right? But nevertheless, that's what I've done. And I've actually gone to an O, <laughs> an O so that I don't do that anymore. Uh, but even in those, with the potential introduction of air, I haven't had any issues doing it actually a second time after I've buck, broken the sitch and by the for, for the sake of time we're going to move on okay so um, the next presentation actually will uh, be once again by uh, Marcus uh, Jarbo and it's uh, innovative uses for ultrasound and pediatric surgery well thanks again for letting me do this one uh, hopefully you're not tired of me yet here we go uh, no disclosures still uh, so ultrasound so Sean asked me to do innovative use of ultrasound. It's kind of interesting because innovation pretends new, right? And ultrasound's old. Um, however, there's a lot of new ways you can use it. And there's also, ultrasound's not what it used to be. So the image quality is a heck of a lot better than it used to be. The machines are a lot cheaper. Um, and so, and the probes are a lot better. So you can do a lot of things that you couldn't do before. Um, and there's a lot of techniques that just weren't out there before. So this is, in a way, very innovative, but definitely not in a classical sense. So I'm going to go over a little bit about that and then and then just, just go through a potpourri of things that you can use it for. Some are easy, some are hard, some are, you know, in, the, in between, and some you'll think is crazy, some you'll think is useful, and some you'll think, why does he do that? It's so much harder that way, or something like that. But this is just kind of a, a smorgasbord. So, like I said, ultrasound is old, and use, but there's a lot of new uses, and a lot of things that I use for, and every day I use it for new things. And why? It's because I'm comfortable with ultrasound. And my partners now, who are not interventional radiology trained like I am, uh, also are picking up the same thing all the time. And so, like the epigastric hernia repairs that were just presented at the plenary session, four of my partners have done those on their own. Um, it's because they're used to using ultrasound and they've taught themselves. Um, learning is a problem right now because we gotta, I've noticed doing the ultrasound course, there's a cohort of people who, you know, they're in a busy practice, they've never used ultrasound, they're not comfortable with it, and although they'd really like to learn, it's just like too much of a commitment to actually train themselves in another modality at this, this point in their career. And then there's another group of people who are, I, I don't wanna, uh, I have to put this politely, but they're residents that learn how to line up their needle on these big IJs uh, in, in the adult world and and they kind of think they know how to use ultrasound which they don't necessarily really know how to use it like to its full extent if that makes sense um, and so there's so there's a little bit of a gap there of people who can really use ultrasound to their its full extent um, so that's kind of a, a an important thing to keep in mind so the first thing to do is peripheral IVs. Now this is really simple, and you're thinking, nah, surgeons don't do this kind of thing, and you're right, we don't. However, how many times have you been sitting in the OR waiting for induction and anesthesia because they can't get an IV? Now some places I know anesthesia uses ultrasound for IVs and they're great, but I'm sure there's some people in this room that live in a world that that's not true, right? And so, um, so in our hospital, a couple of us surgeons got pretty good at IVs, and the anesthesia guys, we, we like them, and we get along with them, believe it or not. We share office space with them, and they know I can do it, and so they call me or some one of my partners and say, hey, can you get this IV on this really big kid, this really tough kid? Um, and so, you know, we got good anesthesiologists. They're really good at, at, at MOT. Um, but so what we do is we 
kind of offhand try to start start looking at okay when you call us how long have you been trying and how many sticks have you done already and then you say how many how long does it take us once we bring the ultrasound in and how many sticks does it take us and so right here it says 27 minutes this blue bar on the light that's how long on average the anesthesiologist had been trying and had still failed on these kids and then the two minutes is how long it took us to come in and put the IV in once they called us. We were always successful 100% of the time. On these kids, they have been trying for a half an hour and had failed. And these are good anesthesiologists. The other thing is the number of sticks. Seven and a half sticks on average have been done on these kids. And we came in and on average it was one. I think I started two IVs on one of these kids and it increased the average to 1.1. But nevertheless, uh, very practical, right? Um, so that may or may not interest you, I don't know, but it's helpful and it helps kids and people, some kids don't get central lines that would have got central lines when they didn't need one, they just needed an IV. Uh, supraclavicular central access. So I put all my central lines in like this, this picture here on the left, you know, right above the clavicle. For multiple reasons, it's really nice. But not only do I put my IJs uh, in here, but I, but it, it makes the subclavian accessible if you want to put it on the subclavian vein, but it also makes the anomaly accessible. It also makes the SVC accessible. So if, so it's been a very long time since I've had this guy that I said, oh, I can't get lines in. We, for we routinely, if someone had VA ECMO with their vessels tied off on the right side, we still start off on the right side for our Broviacs because we can directly stick the anominate without any problems. And uh, here's a video of showing that. Uh, oh shoot, oh shoot, hold on. Oh, are you serious? Hey, can you play this back there, guys? Oh, there, there we go, nice, okay. So this is, so that was, here he is, the needle coming into the junction of the IJ and the subclavian vein right here. And just for fun, I think I was, I think it was Pepe, I was one of our fellows, I was riding really hard and I was saying, okay, that was easy, now put it in the SVC for me. Um, because that's plenty far for a line, of course. And you can see here, we're well past the nominate already. And the left nominate's coming here from the right side of the screen. And, and, the, and now the needle is down well into the SVC. So you can imagine how this might be handy in somebody who has a lot of occlusion. That bright spot over there on the left side of the screen, that bright line, that's the lung. So if you don't lose your needle, you'll never hit the lung because you can see where the lung is. So this is a, a kid that actually had a problem. See, okay, and I'm doing a DSA venography here, and you can see that contrast is going the wrong way in the, in the uh, IJ. And so there's a stenosis there in the, in the, in the right brachiocephalic or the arm. And, and you can see the gras do there where the needle is. You can see the needle there. I wish I had a pointer there. There's the needle right here. And you can see the left brachiocephalic there. And then the needle's here and the tip is here. I know in this, you know, it, it, you're thinking I made that up, but you can see it a little bit better um, when it's darker. Um, and then here, the, the needle's par clearly past the, uh, it's clearly past the obstruction now because of um, you can see the contrast entering the right atrium directly. So I almost got into the right atrium on this one. So th that can be pretty useful, right? I mean, pretty useful on occasion. G tubes. Now there's a thousand. There's actually at least eleven or twelve ways I know to put a G tube in. But ultrasound is one way, and it becomes it's very useful a lot of the time. If you have a kid with multiple operations and you don't want to do a long lice of adhesions, uh, or you just like it this way because it's only one incision, it's great. Uh oh. Hey guys, can you do this one too, just like you did? Here we go. Here's the stomach. You can see the liver. You fill it up with saline. You put a couple of T fasteners in here. There's one T fastener. See how it kind of you see it deploy there? Oh, it's kind of cool. Yep, yep, yep. And then you put a second one in. I usually put a three, but I only show two here. Then you put a needle in, and then you put the Amplatz wire through there, which you can see right there. There you go. And then you put the sizer in for the low profile G tube right there. And then put your low profile G tube there, and there you are. And it's pretty cool. Um, and you can see that it's not in the wall of the stomach because the wall is not, the mucosa is not tented up here. It's a nice, very nice defined area so you know you're not in trouble. Um, you also can make sure you're, you know, you're away from the liver with ultrasound and you can also see the bowel and the colon too if it's up there between you and the, you and the, uh, you and the stomach. So it's, it's a really nice, safe way to do reasonably dangerous G-tubes. Dr. Skin, you just wrap that up. What? Yeah, we ran out of time. Oh, I thought that something. was, uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, anyway, here's Aner Sphincter Botox with a hockey stick probe. Uh, 
internal sphincter, external sphincter, um, and then you just put the needle in there. Oops, sorry, uh, we'll go on the adhesions. You can show adhesions so you know whether you can reoperate or not on a baby with gaseous kisses, for example. See on the left, the bowel is moving to the peritoneum. See on the right, it's not, it's stuck. Um, that one on the right ended up looking like this, a laparotomy, and I kind of told him it was going to look ugly. I mean, had to do it anyway, but, but anyway. Um, and then CTOM placement for Crohn's. Uh, We'll just kind of move through this quickly, but you can see you, everybody's had the uh, the Crohn's fistula that you can't, that closed by the time you get to the operating room, but you still need to put a CTON where you can see those fistulas with ultrasound. Um, here's the needle going through the fistula. You can see the sphincter complex is a transphincteric uh, fistula, uh, and then you can pass CTONs that way. You can even get super levator abscesses with CTONs, which I did here. Um, and then foreign body removal. Uh, this is the last one I'll show, but it's kind of cool. Can you play? Maybe I can play. Oh, yeah. Here's the foreign body right there. And then you put a hemostat under direct visualization. Grab it. And watch this. is cool. You can see the splinter just getting pulled here in a second. By the... Oh, yeah. There it is. That's so satisfying. <laughs> anyway. Sorry. And there we go. Uh, anyway. Uh, that's kind of hard. Let me tell you, that is hard. But now it's gone. There we go. Transrectal drains, that's just, most people say IR. And then epigastric hernias, you guys probably saw that in the last talk. So anyway, ultrasound and pediatric surgery, it's so useful. And if you can just uh, commit some time to learn how to use it, it's, man, you can use it. And every day you learn new time, new places to use it, and it's really cool. It's just really cool. So it helps increase your extreme position, minimally invasive access, and also allows possibilities that you never thought of. Herschel comes to me, my partner's coming, hey, can you do this with ultrasound? Well, I suppose so, you know? And it just, it's a great tool worth learning. If anybody ever has any questions, I'm happy to email, or I even thought about doing video teaching, you know, at different centers, um, that's my email. So, thanks. Thanks, Marcus. Um, I'm Bethany Slater from the University of Chicago. For this next portion, we were going to have a panel session regarding introduction of new technology. So we'll try to leave some time for some questions at the end. Um, I'll briefly talk about introducing new devices into the operating room. I'll just kind of skip through some of the points and just try to get to the salient ones for interest of time. And then Dr. Nam Nguyen will talk about introducing new techniques and procedures into practice. And Dr. Barnett will talk about developing a robust equipment and standards committee. So there's really been an explosion of innovation in surgery for the last 10 to 20 years, which has clearly advanced our field. But it's very important to think about the safety of the patient while introducing new techniques and new technology. So there's certainly a balance between the advancement and also the safety of the patient. Specifically with regards to new devices, there's really a spectrum when you're trying to introduce a completely new device uh, versus a new to the institution or just a modification of the device. So really the first important thing about trying to introduce a new device into your institution is to review the policies at that particular institution. So if it's considered a research project, you might need to go through your IRB, Many institutions have a quality assessment process, and many now require a business case or a financial analysis. So all of us are available for help with that if needed. And then you want to keep in mind if your device is FDA approved and if you're using it for that indication or an off-label use. And then certainly some device, particularly in pediatric surgery, are accessible for investigational device exemptions, which can be used for clinical trials or in the emergent setting or the compassionate use setting. And then similarly, the humanitarian device exemptions for very rare diseases, which we commonly see. In preparation for introducing a new device, you certainly want to review any safety profile or available complication da data. This might not be available for a new device, but you certainly want to look for this. In a very new device, it might be useful to use an animal model to test it first before using it for humans. If that's not available, a simulated environment such as a lab or the operating room without a patient is very helpful. And this also allows to train the team with the new device as well. Um, if a device has been used elsewhere, it's certainly helpful to have a mentor by either going to another institution or having someone come to your hospital first and telemedicine is a good augmentation for that as well. 
The Society of University Surgeons published a very nice position statement regarding the application of innovation in which they really stress three different points. Uh, they really stressed having a local surgical innovations committee that can review these new devices and they could really assess the safety profile and efficiently introduce some new technology. They stress the importance of having an informed consent, which is certainly very important to talk to the families about new devices and what alternatives there are. And then finally, they made the point of submitting new innovation to a national innovations registry, which has been done very successfully with certain devices and techniques. And that way you can really study the outcomes and learn from other people. Uh, finally, just some other tips. Um, certainly discussing this with the team members to get buy-in from everyone and empowering the whole team. Um, using sort of a stepwise approach, which I think that Marcus highlighted really nicely in his presentation, to have alternatives or fallback methods if the device is not working very well. And then using other subspecialties or adult surgeons if they're available in the hospital to help you out as well. And then I'll pass it over to Dr. Nguyen. Thank you. Um, I have nothing to disclose. So this is a very common question many of us ask. They say, I just learned a new technique and I wanted to introduce my workplace where I, get, uh, where I go from here. Um, particularly uh, in the era of minimally invasive surgery. Um, unfortunately, there is not a whole lot of uh, standard protocols or prior <clears throat> guidelines that are available. And if you really try to do uh, literature search, there's a very little thereof. Um, we all know that innovation is extremely important and it serves our patients well for many years. Um, as uh, Viscan once said, as most surgeons innovate on a daily basis, tailoring therapies uh, and operations to the uh, intrinsic uniqueness uh, of uh, every patient and their disease. Unfortunately, there's a lot of uh, competing interests, such as industry financial incentives. Uh, certainly physicians uh, wanted to maintain or remain their competitive edge, uh, certainly will push their uh, envelope to some degree and lure the technologies or the procedures themselves. And they also hospital financial pressure. And in many cases, either patients or families will come in and demand for a certain procedure that they know or read about. Um, we know that the importance of the um, innovation, uh, but we also unfortunately know that uncoordinated introductions of procedure or technology leads to poor outcome. And it is very important and it's our responsibility to balance between innovation and patient safety. We Not Alone is an organization. SAGE has struggled the same thing for many years. And as such, they formed a uh, guideline committees and they did extensive literature research and that um, there was really very little re uh, information that will uh, provide guidance. And so they relied on uh, uh, leadership surveys. So they sent out a uh, survey to 35 uh, board members and uh, they got 60% of response, which is a 25, uh, 21 uh, people have responded. And of that, among other things, they feel that as a society, it is our responsibility to disseminate <laughs> information to the constituents uh, for knowledge and hopefully narrow the knowledge gap. Um, it is also, they pointed out the performance surgeon's responsibility to learn all those steps before introducing new technologies, such as familiarize uh, with the uh, procedure themselves, uh, both cognitive and hand-on uh, training. Isolated training tend not to work. They recommended it have to be some sort of multidisciplinary, such as courses that we put in uh, for, you know, APSA and IPEX uh, alike. And uh, we must disclose uh, to the patients when consent regarding to our expertise and whatnot. And then uh, 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 proctorship and preceptorship is also very important, particularly the first couple of cases. And uh, it is very important that we have, must maintain our uh, outcome. Um, Regarding to how you introduce into uh, the te new techniques uh, to the hospital, they feel that the IOBs and the uh, uh, credential committee play a central role in this uh, process. Um, 
uh, as well as the surgeon um, uh, his or herself. So uh, Royal College of Surgeon also uh, issues uh, similar uh, recommendations, and um, uh, they have a very stringy, uh, uh, stringent um, uh, criteria, as uh, you can say right there. We have to discuss the technique with a relevant, relevant specialist um, and get a uh, prior approval. So in summary, I think as an organization, the minimal we can do, though, is that we can provide the information to our constituents to narrow the knowledge gap. And it also, we know that it's essential to have uh, innovation, but we must not compromise patient safety. And the surgeon responsibility is to obtain unnecessary training for all the, um, um, uh, before you introduce the new techniques. Thank you. So in the interest of time, we'll, um, I'll ask Dr. Russell Wu uh, to join us on stage from Hawaii, who's brought in a lot of uh, not only innovative products, but also uh, new technologies into the hospital, and we'll open up the forum for any questions that you may have. I'm sort of a legacy member of the committee, so I'll start us off with some questions, um, both for Dr. Nguyen and Dr. Slater. So both of you highlighted the importance of informed consent. And I think, I, I guess a straightforward question would be, is it important really to explicitly state this is the first time I'm using this device or this is the first time I'm doing this procedure? Uh, I think it is a very important. I think it's, uh, uh, if anything at all, it will be a liability. Um, I do. Uh, I remember the first time I uh, did a TEF, I told him, I said, I'm very comfortable with the scope and also comfortable with the open procedure. <clears throat> uh, we can always rely, you know, fall back on the, on the opening, but uh, we'll certainly, uh, this is the first rodeo, so to speak. You know, in, in general, being transparent and obvious is, and honest is very really important. So however that's said exactly, um, it's just important to disclose what you're going to be doing. Yeah, I, I just add, you know, because especially with these inguinal hernias and other things, I really, I stress to them, I actually tell them how many I've done or, you know, if it's one or none, and I tell them exactly what I'm going to do. I tell them you can back out. Uh, no problems at all. We can do it any old way, and and uh, just let them know that hey, this is this is new. Yeah, because if you don't disclose, the lawyer will ask you. Yes. Uh, another question on, on devices. I guess um, uh, pull the audience. How many uh, people in the audience have modified an existing piece of equipment or device uh, for use in the operating room and on their patients? So I think it's very common as pediatric surgeons, right? Many of our tools and equipment aren't perfectly suited to the patients that we have to take care of. Um, so open to the panel. Uh, can you give them any, uh, I guess, insight into any protections or what are the consequences of such modification for them? Well, I, I think um, as Dr. Wu has mentioned, I mean, I think, you know, for things like GJ tubes, I think we change the size a lot and we certainly do it, but it's certainly not in the indications from the FDA approvals to do that. So you really don't have much protection if you're going to do something like that, if there's a problem. So really have to be careful with that. And I would, I would, um, stress that you can try to help as a consultant for companies to create smaller devices for our pediatric patients if need be. Question. Nathan Novotny, Royal Oak, Michigan. Um, so I, I spend a fair amount of my time overseas and I try to implement new technologies and things overseas as well, but I was just wondering if you, uh, if, if anybody on the panel has had any experience with doing innovative things overseas and uh, the, the ethical and um, challenges that come with all of that. Yeah, I uh, have uh, uh, did some missions in Vietnam, um, introducing some of the uh, new uh, procedures that are commonly done open um, that 
Uh, I uh, teach them how to do uh, laparoscopically or thoroscopically. Um, I think in terms of the consent, <clears throat> it's not as, uh, as rigorous as, uh, as in, in the U.S. Um, and um, uh, unfortunately, I, or fortunately, that the majority of them do trust uh, us uh, from, uh, you know, uh, training the West to perform those kind of procedures. So in terms of uh, ethical, um, I, I guess, uh, unless you pursue something that is for the first time using them as sort of, you know, uh, an experiment in the uh, purpose, then, then I don't think that's a problem with ethical issues. And for the uh, few of the companies that I've worked for, it's much easier to get a CE mark than it is to go through the whole FDA process. So a lot of companies will <coughs> obtain the CE mark first, which helps pave the way to get through the FDA process a little bit quicker as well. So, yeah. I, as far as overseas stuff, I just want one more thing. I, I don't I don't do brand new stuff overseas. I do stuff that I already do because um, usually the environment's tougher when you're overseas. It's not easier. Um, and so I don't like doing experimenting. I think I don't think it's really right to do something you haven't already done in states overseas in a difficult environment that you don't work in usually. So I, if I'm doing something I'm already doing, then I don't worry about anything unusual about the consent because I do it all the time. Hi, Jim Pierce, Central California. Um, I was really interested in the uh, Equipment and Standards Committee. I was wondering if you could post some of that on the Quality Safety Toolkit. Uh, absolutely. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, Mark Mazziotti, Houston. Um, we learned that reimbursement is a bad word, so I'm supposed to use the word payment. So with these extra things that we're doing, ultrasound, et cetera, which we seem not to get paid for, uh, is there any advice on how that might change for those of us that don't have formal uh, radiology training so yeah so I'm not a radiologist well Herschel would get upset if I said that um, because I didn't do my radiology fellowship I did do an IR fellowship I, I don't really to be quite honest I'm not a hundred percent sure how to handle it perfectly I mean right now with the inguinal hernias I'm putting a laparoscope in so it's a laparoscopic hernia repair and that's how I bill it because I think that's ethically, morally, and correct because I'm putting a laparoscope in. Um, it's a really good question, kind of where that's, you know, I don't think they're going to do a special uh, code for inguinal hernia repairs with ultrasound anytime soon. Um, I, I just kind of. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your attending the session. Thanks.